December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. The United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. I was a small town kid from New Jersey. My dad was in the Navy. My oldest brother was already in, so I wanted to go. After the Pearl Harbor attack, patriotism was running very high, and you had to have parental consent to join the armed forces at 17. And my mother did not want to sign, but my father said, let them go up there to New York. They're not going to accept them, because I was a very skinny kid. I think I weighed about 118. So I went up to New York, enlisted, and they accepted me. So it was kind of shock to my mother. <laughs> I wasn't too bad a looking guy. When the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, millions of Americans were galvanized into a patriotic gesture that also put them in contact with something larger than themselves, a goal, a, a quest, a mission. After completing advanced fire control school, the first ship I was assigned to was at the USS Melvin. It was the proudest day of my life when I finally walked aboard that ship. She looked like, to me, like everything I wanted, a fighting ship. I was thrilled and excited. The sad part was that as we sailed by Long Branch, New Jersey, I could see my hometown. I was seasick as a dog. Just throw it up and retching and get me off. <laughs> well, I was never seasick again, strange enough. Everybody, we wanted to face the enemy. I wasn't thinking anything else. I didn't miss my parents. I didn't miss home, anything. Destroyers were known as the tip of the spear. We were detached single destroyers to go out, and our purpose was we detected on our radar major Japanese flights coming down to, to alert the main landing area to that. More destroyers were either sunk or damaged in the Okinawa campaign than the rest of the total war in the Pacific. A destroyer is essentially a warship that was like a giant cigarette boat from Miami Vice. It was nothing but engine and hull, with a few guys studded around it with guns. Being a frontline ship, we're often lost. I recently read one tally that had 77 American destroyers lost, 17 of them by kamikaze attack, which seemed in that list to be the leading cause of destroyer mortality. This is a, a very good photograph. And in combat, guess where I was? Right up top in the director here. Wherever we pointed on target, the guns automatically pointed. There were moments when I was afraid, not sure if I was going to live or die. But one thing for certain, I wanted to fight and save our ship. And the patriotism was raging in my blood. The first combat I saw was at Saipan where we discovered a surface blip on our radar, and it, it was a submarine, which we subsequently sank. Shortly thereafter, that same night, we picked up another submarine signal, and then we sank that submarine also. So that was my first kind of little bit of excitement. Felt great. That's what I, was, that's what I wanted to do. When we got to the Philippines, the kamikazes became quite frequent. You're literally on your own, and we didn't give it another thought till the Japanese wised up and decided to kamikaze us. For the 1930s and into the 1940s, Japanese youth had been inculcated into this culture of Bushido, the warrior culture of Japan, and they had been force-fed 
the idea that all was for the emperor. The emperor was the god of Japan. That it was better to smash yourself in defense of the emperor than uh, to remain whole. Because the planes were coming at a given ship in a swarm, and they were not the most predictable pilots in the world. They were, oftentimes, they were making their first and last flight on that trip. The idea being that you would have so many planes in the air, each loaded with explosives or carrying a bomb or both, that the enemy couldn't possibly shoot all of them out of the sky. It was like, it was the aerial equivalent of a bonsai charge. During a kamikaze attack, being in the main battery director, we were on telescopes. Looked like he was coming right down our throat. I was kind of frightened. My heart was pounding. One that looked like he was going to hit us. We kept hitting him, we kept hitting him, and I'm saying, well, God, this guy's going to hit us. I could see a flex of his wings breaking up. That's the moment I looked death in the face. And then all of a sudden, the ocean came into view, and a head crashed in the ocean. It was a new experience trying to kill an opponent who only wanted to kill you and not survive. Did anybody at that time says they weren't scared? I, I don't think they're telling the truth. A lot of destroyers were sunk. By October of 1944, when we get to the invasion, the Japanese empire uh, has now been re-woven into a noose. And the Americans, the, the allies, are pressing forward on multiple fronts. There were more than 300 ships involved, 200,000 men. It took place across 100,000 square miles. The scale alone makes it the biggest naval battle in history. October 24, 1944. It was 3 a.m. Our destroyer squadron received orders that we were going to be the additional combat attack on the Japanese force. It involved a number of warships, battleships, cruisers, destroyers, probably one of the last great battles involving warships. You only saw a few battles in World War II that had anything like this volume. Much more often it was task force on task force or ship on ship, but never anything of this grand scale. The Japanese had believed the entire war that there would be one great battle in which they would smash the Americans and that would be the end of it. It was an article of faith with them. And that's why it was so important for the Americans to win. As we closed in on our torpedo run, we were illuminated by star shells. They were literally over the ship. So we were lit up like daylight at that moment. The Japanese wanted to kill us before we could kill them. And by this time, the cruisers and battleships were firing so they could fire all their main batteries at them. The sky is completely black. There's no moon. The Melvin and the other destroyers are keyed up. They are revving their engines. They're at their maximum speed. There is water splashing on the decks of these destroyers from incoming enemy rounds. It's like something out of the movies. We could see the shells from the battleships and the cruisers, just like going through there, just like that floating light. Then they would come down. When there was a hit, it would be an explosion. It's a sight I'll always remember. The Japanese ships were firing on us, and the shells were landing with huge splashes on all sides of the ship and in front of us. The ship was shuddering. We had to keep going, because I was in the director. I'm hearing other ones say, wow, that was close. But I could hear the boom boom straddling in the ships. It all happens so fast, you don't think. You just want to do your job, and get out. We went in fast, dropped our torpedoes. We hit the Japanese battleship Fuso, broke it in half, and sunk it. And we were out of there. The 
Fuso went down with great explosions, and there were those who survived and got off the ship who spoke afterwards of seeing it appear to break in half. It was clearly mortally wounded. We made it a quick turn, and the uh, engine runners were told to make smoke, so we were retiring under a whole screen of black smoke. When Phil Hollywood aboard the USS Melvin as part of the Americans defending the Surigao Strait undertook that battle, they were beginning the Battle of Leyte Gulf, which effectively destroyed the Imperial Japanese Navy as a force in the rest of the war. When I look back at that battle, I feel so lucky that we survived. I think it's important that we tell these stories so that people don't forget what was sacrificed for our freedom. So I've talked to my children and my grandchildren because I think they should know what, what went on. If we all keep it a secret, history will never know. I would describe war as pure carnage, destruction of facilities and of human lives. It's an incomprehensible to me how this happened. So I believe in talking about it. I'm proud of my service to my country. <laughs>